Today is September the 29th, 2020. I'm going to close a little short this evening so that we can so that we can get home and see what's what with the debates that is. So um, we have an opportunity to go to the Lord in prayer. There's always plenty to be thankful for and to ask for. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your word that you never change. We thank you that you have given us hope, confident expectation of what lies ahead. There may be storm clouds brewing, but in our soul there is rejoicing and happiness because of who you are and what you have planned for us. There may be suffering, but that's part of life. It prepares us to and helps us to trust in you. Pray for Dot this evening that you'll help her to recover from the fall she had and that she won't have any lingering uh, repercussions because of it. We thank you for this church, for these people who are hungry. They're hungry for your word. And we thank you for that and pray that you'll help us to focus and concentrate this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Since somebody said something about maybe having a little bit of levity before we begin, there's enough horror stories going around. And so I thought I would show a quick slideshow. And Cindy, can you flick off this? This is the first one on the right, all the way to the right. Pardon? No, I don't do it. When I bring this up, there's going to be a baby in it. Play close attention to his the look on his face. <laughs> it says, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Four babies. <laughs> uh, if you see the book and he's reading that, I imagine that's the way some other people feel, I think, when uh, they hear the, what God is able to do. I really don't mind getting older, but my body is taking it badly. Are y'all all in tune with that? Okay, y'all take care. We just lost uh, a large portion of our folks tonight. Uh, Dot fell on the way, way in, and uh, they're taking it to the emergency room. So our thoughts and prayers are with her. She's able to walk, but uh, I think that's the right thing to do. We're going to keep on with our doctrine. Well, as soon as we finish the funnies. Age is just a number. Yeah, and jail is just a room. The doctor said at my age I should really install a bar in the shower, so I did. I don't always go the extra mile, but when I do, it's because I missed my exit. Don't do that in Houston. My mind is like my internet browser. 19 tabs open, three of them are frozen, and I have no idea where the music is coming from. Look at that. Garth is laughing at that. He <laughs> okay, that's enough. I need my light back on, thank you. Uh, 
Okay, now, we have to focus now. We know Dot's on her way. She's in good hands. It could be nothing, or it could be something. But anyway, uh, the Lord is with them. We've prayed for her. So now it's a test for us to concentrate on his word. We'll, we'll find out soon if she's okay, if she has any anything that is of consequence. So turn in your Bibles this evening to Romans chapter 1, verse 22. Romans chapter 1, verse 22. And I'll put up on the board... This is the translation after I have gone through all of the exegesis. Short verse. It had professing, but I believe, although they claimed to be wise would fit better, they became fools. They became fools because they accepted foolish moronic ideas. And the mo word moronic is the word used for fools. In the Greek, it is morino, I believe is what it is, and it is means where we get the word moron from, or moronic. That's where we ended last time, so we start a new lesson this evening, starting in Romans chapter 1, verse 23. Romans 1, 23. And, referring to the people who profess or allege that they are <clears throat> wise, they became fools, and, and <clears throat> they also did this, they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. This is absurd that people would call themselves wise that reject the truth that they know about God, and we have learned that every person that is a rational person, there are some that never were able or never will be able to understand the things of God because they're not mentally competent to be able to. But for the great majority of us, all of us know that God exists by his creation. And those that reject that idea do it because they suppress the truth. <clears throat> they, <clears throat> excuse me. They don't want to be held accountable. They want to do what they want to do without any restrictions. And so they do a very foolish thing by just saying that God doesn't exist. And of course, for a long time now, they go to the place of Everything has evolved. Evolution. That really has been rebutted and done away with. However, it still exists in our schools. It exists in the minds of a lot of people. It, it has never made sense and never will make sense. And yet, that is a refuge for them and they act like they're really intelligent. Those who subscribe to evolution are described in this verse, this previous verse. Are they claim, are they, although they claim to be wise, they became fools, accepted foolish moronic ideas, and the people who subscribe to evolution fit that, that, that description. And we know better that uh, they know about God, they're just suppressing the truth. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. This is a quote from Robert James Utley, the gospel according to Paul, and this is what he, Mr. Utley says. Verses 23 through 32 describe God's rejection, that's temporal wrath. Temporal wrath means it's just temporary wrath 
of the pagan world and its re religiosity. And he puts here, and ours. Religiosity is very much alive and well in America 2020. Indeed, in the entire world, the entire globe, can be characterized as infected with religiosity. People love religion. They don't love God. They don't love his word, but they like to go through the motions. They like the ritual. They like the sounds. They like the smells. They like the ambiance. They like all these things. They like to get together with other people. Most churches are nothing more than a glorified country club. They'll try to endure 15 minutes of a sermonette, and then it's all about ritual and communication with one another. Now let's look at this word here. It says they exchange the glory. The word exchange the glory here is alasso, A-L-L-A-S-S-O. It's a verb, an aorist active indicative. So there was a point in time that they changed the glory of God to something else. <clears throat> and it means the meaning of this word, alasso, is to exchange one thing for another. Exchange. It's not that you're changing something that exists and just changing it. No, it means that you're changing, exchanging one thing for another. It's not changing something that exists. It's exchanging, getting something else. Note that they did not change the glory of God, which cannot be done. No one can change the glory of God. Rather, they exchanged the glory of God for images that they created. This has to be the worst trade ever made, and yet they boasted about how wise they were. And people still do the same thing today. You have people that de denigrate the Bible, and they foolish in their foolishness, they mock the Bible. And they have made this trade. The people who have rejected God's revelation of himself have made this change. They exchanged the phenomenal, magnificent God and his creation for something else. And what something else is is, we just saw, we hadn't got to it yet, but creatures, how insane is that? So they exchange the glory of God, and it, of course it says the incorruptible God, which is aphartos, A-P-H-T-H-A-R-T-O-S, aphartos, it's an adjective, genitive singular masculine, and it means impervious to corruption and death. Our God is impervious to corruption and death, imperishable, incorruptible, immortal. That is our God. I see this word impervious, imperviousness. When I worked at the University of Texas Medical School, I guess that was in the 70s when it was being built. And they had a lot of labs there that have acid and all these other things. And they have this kind of pipe that is um, impervious to any kind of acid and any kind of uh, harsh chemicals or anything like that. It's called dur iron. Dur iron pipe. It, and it, was un, it was different than every other pipe. And that was uh, for the chemicals and so forth. And then there was another type of very uh, toxic and uh, where they, they had a place there where they would take uh, samples of um, even the type of waste that would be um, hazardous, hazardous material. And uh, they used glass pipe for that. A lot of people think, when they think of a plumber, 
oh, that's a guy that doesn't stop sewers. They have no idea the training that it takes to be a journeyman plumber. And you could say the same thing about electricians and carpenters. Uh, for a long time, society has looked down on these people. Oh, those are blue-collar workers. They didn't go to college. And so they're kind of uh, looked at in a condescending way. If they only knew what they, what, what they had to learn. There's about a, a dozen different types of pipe. And every one of those, th those type of uh, pipes have to be fitted together, cut in a certain way. Uh, it, have you ever seen glass pipe before? It's, it's amazing. It, it's pretty thick. And the way that you cut it, of course, is to score it. And then you heat it and it comes out. But the end of the pipe needs to have a bead on it so the couplings and all can fit and not slip off. And so you put that pipe, that uh, glass pipe on rollers and you roll it and you heat it just the right temperature, the right distance away, and it forms a bead. And you keep rolling and you heat it. And when you're done, it's got a bead on it that can, it can be used. And I, I could go on and on about these things, but it, it, that's what popped in my mind when I thought about impervious. That these pipes have to be made out of what they are or else they wouldn't last a year and the toxic materials would, would eat through there. Well, there's nothing that's going to eat through the perfection and the incorruptibility of our immortal God. That is a, a, impervious is a good word. God is impervious. I can tell you who is not impervious to corruption and that is our government. Oh, you know, it just seems like we all suspected that there was corruption in our government. I would say we all have suspected that for a while. But starting in this year especially, it just like jumped out and said, here I am. And we're talking about in the uh, FBI, the uh, Justice Department, the CIA, everywhere you look, there is corruption. And it's very much not impervious to that, but aren't you glad that our God is? These same people refused to worship God for who he is and rather reduced him to their own level through idolatry. They minimized the vast chasm between creature and the creator. That is a very important distinction. I used to listen to tapes from Charlie Clough. It's called the Framework Series. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of that, but it's free. You can go online and just put the Framework Series, Charlie Clough, and he goes, uh, Charlie is a, he went to MIT. He's a brainiac, and he, he brings out things in text that you, would, you, would, you wouldn't know were, were there. But he, in this series, he makes a huge issue out of the distinction between the creator and the creation. The people who reject the knowledge they have of God have erased that distinction. They have put themselves on the same level as God. And you think, well, that's ridiculous. Well, that's what they've done. When you reject his truth and you come up with your own truth, it's a sign that you think you know better than God knows. And when he has revealed in his word that everyone has knowledge of God through the creation, so they are without excuse. But to that, to, to them, that's nonsense. And so just remember that. God is the creator, and when we talk about him, speak to him, reference him, it should be with Great deference and respect and fear. He, he's the creator of all things. Remembering the creator-creation distinction can hardly be overstated. When it is not recognized, man foolishly considers himself on an equal plane with God. I imagine all of you have talked to someone at one time or another, who is an unbeliever or maybe an agnostic, an atheist, or maybe they believed in evolution. These are people who are suppressing the truth and they talk as if they know better than God. 
Our job is not to judge them. Our job is to enlighten them with the truth if they will have it. If they don't and they totally are negative, we move on. So this is what we have so far. We have an exchange the glory of the incorruptible God and now we go to the phrase for an image in the form of corruptible man. We'll just take it that far. For an image in the form of corruptible man. You see that I took the in the form of and I crossed it out. The King James Version of this verse is better, but we are dealing with the New American Standard. And so this actually means for an image of an icon or idol. That's what that word means. Of corruptible man. Other things as well, but we'll start with man. In the form, that word in the form, form means acon. That's the way it is in the Greek, E-I-K-O-N. That's an omega and not an omicron, so it's not acon, it's acon, where we get the word icon. It's a noun, it's a genitive singular feminine, and this is the meaning. The third meaning, by the way, in the BDAG lexicon, that which, re that which represents something else in terms of basic form and features, form or appearance. So I thought I would go to the English word icon, I-C-O-N, that comes from the Greek word acon, and see what it has to say. So this is from the, let's see, what is this? The Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, Collegiate Dictionary, 1996. So we have icon is a noun. It's Latin from Greek akon, which is our word, and from akonai, means to resemble. Both of them come from that same Greek word. So here are the meanings for the English word icon. A usually pictorial presentation or image Two, a conventional religious image typically painted on a small wooden panel and used in the devotions of Eastern Christians. Three, an object of uncritical devotion, idol. So this word, acon, which we call icon, is referring to an idol. And number four, emblem or symbol. Sometimes you would say, like, the house became an icon of the 1860s residential architecture, Paul Goldenberg. So we say they're, they're an icon. And we don't, uh, when we say that, we don't mean it in a negative way, do we? We mean that it, it, exceptional. He's some, someone that someone looks up to, he or she, whatever they endeavor to do. But I, the reason I gave you this, because I wanted you to see for sure, even though Acon means that which res uh, represents something else in terms of basic form features. It says everything but an idol. And I wanted to show you that it is an idol. That's what it's referring to. So, for an image, they exchanged the incorruptible God for an image of corruptible man. Of corruptible man. Notice that God was athartos, a p h d h a r t o s, incorruptible. But man is just thartos, which is corruptible. The a right up here on see the word with the red line under it there, athartos. The a is called an alpha negative. It means it's just like putting a not in front of the word. So not corruptible. And man is just far tars, far tars, which is corruptible. And then we have, uh, uh, and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. The worship of gods in the form of animals was common in the pagan world. In the ancient Near East, people worshipped such animals as bulls, jackals, hawks, and serpents. I can't, I can't see anybody worshiping a serpent. The, of course, the Egyptians were big on that, but uh, I 
would like to uh, do anything but worship a servant. Psalm 106 recounts how the Israelites disobeyed God by worshiping an idol in the form of a golden calf. Do y'all remember that? How's it going, Morgan? Okay. Where are they going to? What? Oh, there's an ambulance. Okay. Before we go, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you know what's going on here with Dot and that it's more serious than we anticipated. We're glad that they made the decision to take her and now she's, uh, they said that she has at least a concussion and something that she described that may be even worse. I can't produce, uh, I can't pronounce it. And so we pray that you'll give them a safe journey over there, that you'll be with Pete as well, that he will comfort her, and that when she gets there that she'll get the uh, treatment that she needs and that she will not be afraid, and none of us will be afraid. She's in your hands. And so we, we do pray that they will make the right diagnosis there and that uh, they'll be able to stabilize her and that uh, this won't uh, go any further than it already has. And we just thank you that we have you to lean on. We've made our request. I know you've heard our request. And now we can be uh, content knowing that uh, she's in good hands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this test gets harder for us to concentrate now. We don't have much time left because we're going to stop earlier tonight anyway. But we can do it. We can, we can concentrate on this. We have to do that in life all the time, don't we? And it's, it's the doctrine. See, God tests us to see if when there is uh, pressure, stress that could be building up in our soul, we can just be relaxed. I mean, we should be thankful that we're this close to Brenham, and Brenham has a, a, a good hospital there and doctors. They made a determination, and now she's going to, I guess it's Brian, is that what she said? I didn't like the idea that she said they might life flight her there. She was just sitting here a few moments ago, and I'm so glad that they made the right decision to take her. So um, anyway... Uh, we'll just continue with uh, taking in the Word. That's what we do. She's always in the back of our mind, but we can still take in the Word. So again, in Psalm 106, recounts how the Israelites disobeyed God by worshiping an idol in the form of a golden calf. You all remember that incident. In Psalm 106.20, it says, Thus they exchanged their glory. This is talking about when Aaron made a golden calf for the people who had rejected God. Moses was up on the hill, up on the mountain for 40 days, and they said, he's left us. And so they appealed to Aaron to make a golden calf. And when it says, and they exchanged their glory, the word glory there is referring to riches. They took their rings, their gold rings and their jewelry and all, and they but took it all together and made this uh, golden calf out of it. So Psalm 106.20 says, Thus they exchanged their glory, riches, for the image of an ox that eats grass. That's pretty poor, isn't it? I mean, uh, and the fact that Aaron did it? By the way, do you know what happened when when Moses came down off the mountain with Joshua um, Moses said, this sounds like there's uh, a war going on down there. And Joshua said, no, that's not war sound. That's, uh, uh, w w how would I say that? Uh, there was an orgy going on down there. And when uh, Moses saw it, he took the Ten Commandments and threw it and broke it. 
And uh, he says, everybody that's on the side of the Lord, come over here. And there was hundreds, if not thousands of them slaughtered. And the rest of them, uh, he he took the, the uh, gold and melted it down and then grounded it up into a, a powder and then threw it in the river, which they had to drink. Uh, he made them all drink of that. I would say he was a bit upset. I'm sure God was as well. Anyway, I thought this is a neat verse because it says again, they exchanged. They exchanged a golden calf for being God's people and Him being their God and them being subordinate and submissive to Him. No, why, why would they do that, by the way? Because that's what the nations were doing. They wanted to be like everybody else. They were a theocratic nation. God was their king. And yet they wanted to be like the other nations. And they told Samuel, tell God we want a king, a physical king, just like the other nations have. And through Samuel, God told him, you're not going to like a king. He's going to take your young men and put them into war. He's going to tax you. He's going to take of the things that you have. It's not going to be a pretty picture. No, no, we want to have him. So they got Saul. Saul started out pretty good, but then he went to the dogs. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. Exodus chapter 32. And we read verses 1 through 6. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we will. We do not know what has become of him. Oh, they're really worried about him. They didn't go looking for him. They, they already wanted God to replace Moses and his God. And Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who has brought you up from the land of Egypt. How heinous is that? The God that protected them at the Red Sea and took them out of bondage with all the miracles that he performed, led them everywhere that they needed to go and... What do they say? It is the God, this calf. Yeah, verse 5. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Do you think he was talking about the, the real Lord? Verse 6. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought, uh, brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. I've got a note here, Genesis 26. I believe it says Genesis 26, 8. They weren't playing uh, far cheesy. 26.8. I don't know if this is... And it came about when he had been there a long time. Did I believe When I saw that the whole Isaac was... Oh, okay. Yeah. The reason I had that note ta there, because in Genesis 26.8 it says, And it came about when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out and saw a window 
and saw, and behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebekah. And that is the Hebrew word, Tachak, that's T-S-A-C-H-A-Q, and it's sometimes translated sporting, and other times it's, it's, it's referring to playing with sexually. So they were having an orgy when he came back. How, how fickle people are, how ungrateful they are, how quick they forget. We certainly don't want to be that way. The next verse is going to take some explaining, and we're getting close to the time I said that we were going to end. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to bring this to an end. This has been an unusual time uh, since I got here. Even with Scott and I were going through training, it didn't go so well tonight. <laughs> I found these things that I was going to show him on Logos, and none of them worked. Maybe one of them did. And I came out of there, and I saw a dot over here. She had fallen. And uh, it's just uh, things that we have to be prepared for. And I am so... Um, impressed with both Dot and Pete. And Pete in this situation, I've seen him in it so many times, like a rock. There was a time when she was in Brenham Hospital, they were going to transport her by ambulance to Bryan. They didn't know whether she was going to make it or not. And Pete, with all of us that were sitting, standing around there, said, y'all come over here, and he prayed. And out, you would think out of all the people, there were probably half a dozen, eight maybe there, that he would be the one that would be uh, most wobbly. Not at all. Just like a rock. And, he, you know, he, I, I can see him so many times in that position, and not too when it's the other way around, uh, that stability. And what an impression they make on to me, and I'm sure to you as well. And so uh, we just pray that God, God has a continued plan for Dot, and uh, we'll just see. Uh, Mary, will you make sure that you post anything, any information on the Internet, if uh, whatever we find out? Okay, thank you. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. What would we do without your word? We thank you for your love for your protection, for your provision, that when things happen as they always do, you are always with us side by side. Your word is in us. In fact, you're in us. So is the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. And so we pray that you will help us to remember those things and be strong. We're not strong in our power. We have no power. But when we're thinking doctrine and we recognize that you're in control of all things and you have a perfect plan, then it makes it easier for us to understand the slings and arrows that we feel in this life. But we always have you and we will have you all eternity because you're phenomenal grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.